Uh oh, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now it's going the right way. Okay, well, here I am. <laughs> and it's time for, it's Thursday, November 5th. And it's time for a ladies' fellowship, ladies' Bible study. Adjust this a little bit. There we go. And here I am in my living room. And any of you are welcome to join us in my living room on any Thursday at 1 o'clock. Um, I think that um, it would be nice to get together and um, have this study in person. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. I've got this thing here, and I hope that you'll be able to see my verses. Okay, as I get ready to put them up. All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. And um, hello to whoever's already here, and we hope that more will join us shortly. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for your love and your care. We thank you for what you're doing in our nation. And Father, we just pray um, for righteousness and justice to prevail. We thank you and we praise you for it. pray that you guide us as we study your word and that um, you will speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, there she is. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to start a new book of the Bible. Um, we're going to study the book of John. In the youth, I'm, I'm studying Matthew. Um, and with you all, I'm going to be, we're going to be studying the book of John. So a little introduction. Um, we know that um, the author of this book is John. Um, he is the son of Zebedee. He actually never refers to himself by name in the book of John. He refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And um, his brother is James. So he is the John of the pair, as in James and John. And um, they were also nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. And I, I, um, I mean, I knew that, but I never really thought about it. And it kind of hit me how odd that John is the apostle of love. And yet in his youth, he and his brother were, were nicknamed Sons of Thunder. Um, maybe because they they were loud or maybe um, they had a bit of, of temper. I don't know. They were the ones who their mother um, wanted them to sit one on either side of, of Jesus when he came into his glory. So I'm not sure exactly what, what all the background of that is, but it's just an interesting thing. This book was written about um, 80, 84, AD, not the number 80, but a letter A D after death of of Jesus A D um, between 85 and 90. So this would have been after Jerusalem was um, was run over by the Romans and the temple was destroyed. So this would have been approximately 50, 55 years after Jesus um, ascended back up into heaven. So assuming that John was one of the youngest of the disciples, if assuming he was around 20, he would have been maybe 75, between 75 and 80. He was an elderly man. So um, maybe he learned a few things as he matured and, and grew older and, and witnessed so much um, persecution and hardship as, as the years went by. Um, but he is known as the, um, the disciple or the apostle of love. Um, and, and you see a lot about love in his books. Um, let's see, his purpose in this book was, is to demonstrate to his readers who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. So that's basically his, um, his theme, the theme of the books. His audience would have been new believers, it's original audience, new believers, and those that were searching. Um, it's in, okay, I already said that. Um, so let's go ahead and open right up to the book of John. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. They have um, mostly the same events, mostly in the same order. 
John, um, on the other hand, has a handful of events, and his, his purpose is not to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of the life of Christ. Rather, it is to show you through the accounts that he gives um, that Jesus is God. He is, he is the divine Son of God. Um, so that's, that is his purpose. So we begin at the beginning, um, a very good place to start in John 1, 1. And it starts off by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going to move this up here. And this is, here it is. I hope you can see it. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All right, the same was in the beginning with God. All right, let's let's um, look at that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this parallels very closely with um, Genesis 1-1 that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, that, um, so um, we know that, that it, here it says the word was, in the beginning with God and it says in Genesis that God was in the beginning God created everything and so we see that the word that we're talking about here and in your Bible you'll see that it's capitalized um, uh, the word was with God and the word was God so that seems like a contradiction first the word is with God and then the word is God and so it's something that's hard for us to understand I am with my mother, who is here. Okay, I, I, she says not to show her, and, and besides that, I, I would mess up my camera placement. So <laughs> if she were sitting right in front of me, I could just switch the camera. What's sitting right in front of me is the dog. <laughs> yeah, can you see her on the chair there? There, there she is, sleeping. Okay, so I didn't mean to interrupt myself, and there I did. <laughs> I did interrupt myself, and I'm so sorry. All right, um, so we have that, that Jesus is God. He was with God, and he is God. So how is that? We're going to explore a little bit about that, about Jesus being God and, and the Word. And so um, uh, we see in Isaiah 48, 11, we're going to jump around a lot of scriptures. You may want to write them down, but hopefully I'll camp out long enough on each of them that if you're familiar enough with your Bible and have the time, if you're driving, well, if you're driving, you probably wouldn't be watching this, but um, yeah, look, look them up or at least write them down and look them up later. Um, so we know that um, from this verse that I'm going to read you, Isaiah 48, 11, it says, For my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. So the whole paragraph is talking about how he's going to um, restore Israel. And how he's going to, um, after he has refined them and tested them, then for his own sake, he's going to raise them back up. And then he says, I will not give my glory to another. So what that means is that God alone is to be worshipped. God alone is to be glorified. And we're not supposed to put anything next to God or anything, any other God to compare to him because he does not share his glory with another. And yet, he's saying here that the word is God. And so we're going to see that he is sharing his glory with the word. And so therefore we know that the word is God. Um, and, and let's just go ahead and look at some verses here. Okay. Um, in, um, all right. In Genesis, we find that God was there at the beginning when he first created the heavens and the earth, obviously. And then in John, we find the word was there too. In fact, it further clarifies that God that God equals the word, or word equals God, and he was there in the beginning. Um, so, let's see. And if we jump over to, in John, uh, I should leave my a marker there. That's what I'm going to do. 
in John verse um, 14. Um, we're jumping ahead because today we're only going to go through the first five verses. In 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see here that he's defining who the Word is that the word became flesh. Well, what aspect of the Godhead became flesh is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Okay, and so it says we beheld his glory. So God is sharing his glory. So this is God. But he's revealing himself as um, God the Son in a hum in human form um, in this scripture. Okay, verse 1, John tells us that Jesus is the Word, and the Word is God. And so, who created? Um, verse 2, in case we missed it, it says, He was in the beginning with God. So, we know that the Word, Jesus, the Son of God, Yeshua, the second person of the Trinity, is God. And He was there at the beginning. He was there before the beginning. Okay. So let's proceed with a few more verses. Let's look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. And this might be familiar to some of you. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And so we see that Jesus Christ, he was in the form of God. He was God and he didn't, it was not robbery for him to be equal with God because he is God. And so it wasn't a big thing um, for, for that to happen. And so we see that, that he did become a man and that he actually is God. All right. And so um, I wanted to, this, this passage here describes the incarnation and lets us know that Jesus Christ is God, but he became human. He came in the flesh and like us, although he didn't have the sin nature. He never sinned. All right. So he, but he deliberately set aside his glory. He deliberately... Um, uh, he, he deliberately just let the glory stay up in heaven and he came, he came here to earth as a human being and people did not, I mean, if, if he had been walking around with a halo, like it shows in paintings, or if he had been walking around, um, with his glory plainly visible, everybody would have known, oh, this is somebody, this is a divine being. But the fact that they accused him of blasphemy says that they just saw a human being. They didn't see, um, if they would have been watching, they would have seen by his actions that, that he was the Messiah. But they, um, they chose to ignore that part. Let's look at 1 John 5.20. It says, it's, a, it's the second to the last verse in, in 1 John. It says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. But So here he's telling us, John, in, in the book of uh, 1 John, um, is telling us very clearly that we that we can know him who is true and that we are in him who is true and this person is the son of God Jesus Christ and then he says this is the true God and eternal life so therefore right there is another scripture that points out very clearly who who Jesus is who this word is that we're learning about um and he expresses the fact that we can know him. Now let's, while we're in 1 John, go to the beginning of 1 John. And let's look at the, the first few verses. <clears throat> I think John really likes to go to the beginning. Because in the Gospel of John, it says in the beginning. And look what it says in, in this letter um, of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Okay, so so um, again, he's declaring, John is declaring, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. Um, and that's his purpose in writing the book, all of the books. All right. Um, now let's go back to John 1. Let's go to the next verse, which, oh, that's not the next verse. They printed out of order. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All things were made through him, and without him was nothing was made that was made. And so here, the word is the creator. So he's taking us back. Not only was he with God and, and asserting that he is divine, the son of God, but he is also the creator. <clears throat> Let's look at some scriptures that talk about him as the creator um, because this is foundational. We need to know who Jesus Christ is. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God or that he is Lord, then you're believing another gospel because the word of God clearly shows us that Jesus is God and that's John's point and that's the point of the first five verses right away he gives you he gives it to you quickly <clears throat> um, let's look at Psalm 100 <clears throat> Psalm 100 verse 3 says says as you know some of these I know by heart but I I want to read them to you to make sure that we don't miss any words and that you know that I'm not making these things up, that it is coming from the word of God. Okay, Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, and if you notice that word Lord, is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So that is the personal name of God. It's actually Yahweh. Um, and that he, know that the Lord, or know that Yahweh, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. And so here he's asserting that Yahweh, God, is God and that he is our creator. So it has it here in the Old Testament. We know in Genesis that, um, you know, the, the creation story. So we won't go through that. But I want you to, to see that in other scriptures, it says the same thing. Um. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 8, back to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. So we go to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go to chapter 8. And here in chapter 8, we're looking at verses 5 and 6. It says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and then in parentheses it says, as there are many gods and many lords, little lowercase l and lowercase g. Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. So here um, it says that he, Jesus, created all things, and that there are so-called gods, little g gods. Um, but they are also created created entities. They are fallen um, principalities um, that rebelled against God. They knew God. They were there at creation. They, they were there. Um, God created them before us. And there is no record of how God created them. But God did create them. Um, and there are stories, you know, that, that about, um, uh, well, in the olden times, they presented themselves to humanity as gods, little g gods, and different ones in different countries and nations um, demanded certain kinds of worship, and certain kinds of sacrifices and what have you, and, and promising that if they would do these things, then they would have good weather, they would have good crops, they would have plenty of children, 
their animals would would um, have lots of offspring. And so um, there were all these little G gods, but God created them too. They're in rebellion um, to, to God, just like much of humanity is. Okay, they rebelled um, and they try to get worship. They try to intimidate and they can try to control their worshipers. And God, God the Father does not. He puts it out there. He says, here I am. I love you. I sent my son Jesus to die on the cross for you. He rose from the dead. Come to me. And he calls people um, and he convicts them. But if a human being says, no, God, I don't want you. And they shake their little fist in, in God's face. Then um, then what, what happens is God says, well, okay, that's your choice. Now, it's also um, their choice whether they spend eternity in heaven with him or not in heaven, in hell without him. Okay, um, that's their choice. But the fallen realm, they want to control and they want to control everybody around them. So when they're in a nation where they have absolute control, like in a communist area, or they go after Christians in, in every communist country, um, once they get control, they start going after Christians because Christians worship God and not the government. So they go after them. Why? Because the entity behind that is, um, is one of these fallen little G gods. But he says here that, um, that, that, um, even though there are gods, that there is only one capital G God and the father of whom are all things. So he's the one that created everything. And, and so even though the little G gods may claim to be extraterrestrials or they may now in our day, they, some of them are, are um, getting themselves to be worshipped as, as little G gods again. But um, we have this idea of ancient astronauts that came and seeded the, the earth with, with life and that they are our creators. No, they're not. They're, those are, that's just another lie to try to get humanity to worship them and not Yahweh God. And so only Yahweh is the creator of all life. And since um, we see that, that um, Jesus Christ is also um, said to be the creator, so we know that he's God. And, and God said, let us make man in our image. So we have, we have um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God in three manifestations and three personalities. And it's it's um, impossible to wrap our minds around. We can say, well, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like that. And those ideas do give aspects, but they're not the full thing. And we, in our human minds, cannot fully understand all of that. So therefore, we must um, receive it by faith. Okay, let's go to Colossians 1. After the two Corinthians, we have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, Colossians 1, we're going to look at verses 15 to 18. He, and he's in the previous um, paragraph, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So right there we see that, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So God is invisible, we cannot see him. And so he made himself manifest through um, Jesus Christ. So then we can get to know him through Jesus. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So Jesus Christ has a preeminence overall because he is God. He created everything. There is, um, as we have in, in our verse here, John 1, 3, it says that without him, nothing was made that was made. And so everything that exists was made by him. He is our creator. Okay, let's go to Hebrews Hebrews 1, and we'll look at um, the first four verses there. Okay, we have, um, says God, 
who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So God, um, throughout the Old Testament, spoke to the prophets in different ways. Um, he says, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so right there we have it again, through whom he made the worlds. And so um, Jesus Christ is the creator, um, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now that we could probably write a whole volume on. We could probably talk for days and weeks, maybe even months on just those couple of verses. But what I wanted to point out is, again, he's talking about the creation of everything through the sun and saying that the sun is the brightness of his glory. Now, um, God told Moses that he could not see his face and live. And yet Jesus Christ is God and we can see him. So he is, he is the express image of his person. Jesus once told one of his disciples who said um, that they wanted to see the Father. And Jesus said, don't you get it? You see me. So you've seen the Father. And so that is the purpose of the incarnation is so that we can see who Jesus is and we can know who God is by seeing um, God in the flesh. All right. Um, now let's move on um, to to our next verse and we're going to talk about light John 1 4 and 5 all right let me put this up here here's verse 4 and verse 5 okay I hope everybody can see it um, John 1 um, Four says, in him, we're talking about the word, Jesus Christ, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. All right, so in God is life. Without God, there was never any life. God was the only life that existed. And he, so in order for him to give life to creation, that meant he had to exist before creation, right? So that make that, therefore he is the creator. Now let's look at some things about light. Genesis 1, 3. It's a Bible study. We're going all over the Bible because um, I, I want us to see how it all fits together. So we're getting to know Jesus as God through the book of John. Genesis 1, 3 says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Okay, so um, there are two Hebrew words for light. One is or, the other is maor. And the one that is or and that is used most of the time, excuse me, is the light. Okay, so you see, you can see me because light is flowing from a light bulb and it's um, reflecting off of me into the camera and then however the technology works. But it's because there is light. God created that light. Um, he said, let there be light. Um, there is light in, and he's talking here about any light. So if, if God had not created light, and then supposing that somehow he had created humanity, but there was no light, we wouldn't have been able to invent a light bulb that would give off light because light is something that God created and it emanated from him because in him is life. Um, let's look at a few Psalms. Psalm 27, um, Psalm 27, one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But the Lord is my light and my salvation. So the Lord is light. The Lord is salvation. Um, that that um, the word or means illumination or um, a luminary. So it can refer to both the light and the thing that gives light. But here 
it was referring to to the light itself um, many people fear the dark you know a lot of children especially are afraid of the dark and so what do we do we put a little night light it doesn't need to be a very bright light just a little light um, and it dispels their fears but when we um, invite Jesus into our hearts because he is light he is the giver of light then we don't need to be afraid according to that Psalm 27 1 let's look at Psalm 104 32 Psalm 104 verse 32 says he looks on the earth and it trembles wait that can't be right no I think that's supposed to be 22. Let's see. No. Ah, it's one and two. <laughs> I, I put down two and then I added one and then I made it look kind of funny there. So here we go. Verse two, but um, let's read one and two. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Okay, it says, Who cover your... O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of the upper chambers, and it goes on describing who God is. But I, I imagine, you know, these people, very patriotic people, they have a huge flag, and they just wrap themselves around, and they just drape themselves in the flag. So they're wrapping themselves in um, the idea of, of patriotism. Okay, but God wraps himself in light. He covers himself with light as a garment. Um, I think that's, that's really cool. Let's look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest book in the Bible. And let's look at a couple of verses there. Psalm 105, it's one that I learned as a child. And it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So not only is God the creator of light, and he is light, but his word is light. His word is light, um, a light to my path. So if you're in a situation where you feel confused, you feel like, where do I go from here? You feel like there's darkness closing in. Just come to the word. The word of God will illumine you. It will bring ore. It will bring light to your life and to show you because God is wrapped in light. And as we read the word, then we his light will come into our soul if we will receive it. All right. And then in that same chapter, just go ahead. You probably don't even have to turn the page. And here it says in verse 130, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And so when these words enter our noggins, then as they enter our, we read, and they enter our minds, then it enters our heart and becomes part of us. Let me read that again. Psalm uh, verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So some people might say, well, I'm not very smart. I don't really understand the Bible. You know what is the coolest thing? A child that is able to read can open this book. And granted, they're not going to be able to understand maybe 90% of it. But God can still speak to them through this word. They'll find something and they'll read it and God will speak to them. I was six years old when I received my first Bible when I was learning how to read. And this passage here was the first passage that my parents showed me how to read. And I read it and I read it and I memorized it because I wanted to. Now I already had memorized some scriptures, but at the age of six, now did I understand everything that it meant? No, but I memorized it and the entrance of that word into my heart, it stayed there. And then the Lord can bring that up to be used at a later date when I was 11 years old and we had changed churches and um, it was uh, we had I had grown up in a Baptist church and now this was um, a charismatic church and they spoke in tongues and I had never heard of it I didn't know what it was and I was a little weirded out and I said Lord show me show me about this 
and I started reading in um, 1 Corinthians um, 12, 13, 14, and there, right there, and did I understand everything that I read? I seriously doubt it, but you know what? When I was 11 years old and I read um, the last verse, or the second to the last verse in 1 Corinthians 14, where it says, forbid not to speak in tongues. And, and I'll let, well, now let me read that again. Um, in, in verse 39 there in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. I remember reading that again and again because it has like a kind of a double negative thing. It says do not and then it says forbid. And I had to, I remember trying to work it through in my mind. But at the age of 11, I honestly sought God to um, help me understand something that I didn't understand. And I didn't understand at all, but I understood that sentence that God spoke to me through his word. And so God can speak to us. God can speak to anybody that's able to read it. God can speak to them through it. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, can tailor make it for every age, every understanding level, every reading level. You read the word and you're seeking God. That, that entrance of his word brings light. The word is a lamp unto your feet and he will show you. So if you feel like the whole world is closing in on you and you're feeling like that you're in darkness, you know, sure, it's it's fine to go to a counselor. That, that can help. Um, sure, self-help books um, can be helpful. You know, I've read books on codependency when I was young and um, I've read marriage books and, and this and that. Those things are wonderful. You know, they if if they have wise counsel, then it's based on godly principles, or it should be. Um, but you know what? This is the one that will bring light. It will dispel the darkness. It will dispel the depression. The hard thing is that when a person is really depressed, it's because there's a spirit of depression there. And that spirit won't let you read it. So you need to rebuke that spirit of depression in Jesus' name. And... Um, Force yourself to do what you don't feel like doing. And somehow or another, God will help you break through that in, in Jesus' name. And he has the power to do that. All right. So, um, so um, the important thing is that not just to hear. It's wonderful, you know, to turn on um, uh, Facebook and listen to a Bible teacher teach. Listen to the preacher preach. I do it. And I get, you know, I get encouraged and I get new insights. God uses different teachers to give me um, um, deeper insights into things that I hadn't thought of before. Just, you know, like listen to pastor teaching or or some of the, the people on the internet. And it's wonderful. It's great to hear that because, you know, God shows each of us as we're studying the word. He might show me one aspect of something and my mother a different aspect of something. And another Bible teacher or pastor, another aspect of it. And, and it's not that any of us are wrong. It's different aspects, like different facets of the diamond. So we have different facets. So as we listen to one another, we different parts of the puzzle fit together, okay, and, and deepen our understanding. But there is nothing like getting into this word on your own. Whether you get a Bible study or whether you just start at the beginning or read on through, or you get a, a, um, a plan, or you take a book of the Bible and you read it through a little at a time and study it up. Um, nothing beats you searching it out for yourself, because what you find for yourself will be the Holy Spirit applying it to your life, and then you will grow a lot more in that way. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 9. We're in and out of the Old Testament. Isaiah, a little after Song of Solomon, we come to Isaiah chapter 9. Okay, and just the first two verses. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. In Galilee of the Gentiles. So actually the, the subject of the sentence is, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And then it describes who is being distressed. And that's the northern part of Israel. Some of the northern tribes there, Zebulun, 
Naphtali. And then it says, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the, um, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. So he says, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed in Galilee of the Gentiles. Um, so that area was an area that was populated mostly with Gentiles. Then verse 2, it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So where was a large portion of Jesus' ministry was in the Galilee, in Capernaum, up in the northern part there around the Sea of Galilee. And so that, that was fulfilled in Matthew 4, um, where it says that when Jesus was there, that he was fulfilling um, this prophecy. And so it's uh, calling him a light because he appeared there and he is the light. All right, so let's um, look now at Revelation 21. So we see that God created light in verse 3 of Genesis. We see that that um, John says that Jesus gave um, light, that he, in him was light, and, his, and, and the light was the light of men. So his, God's life, became our light. All right, and it says, and then the light shines in darkness, in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend that, did not comprehend it. So, um, what I, you know, if um, the the light is on and you can see me, um, and now if if somebody were to suddenly turn the light off, mom, could you turn the light off, please? Just just switch it. it you can do it right over there. Switch over there. Okay, so we're gonna turn off the light. Okay, now see how dark it is? Okay, now turn it back on, please. All right, so now, thank you, that's all. So, did I bring in darkness? No. All we did was remove the light, and it got dark. And as soon as the light came back on, the darkness went away. And so, there, it, yes, there's a scripture that says that God created light, and he created darkness. But in essence, light is a thing, and where there is light, there cannot be darkness. They don't, they cannot coexist, all right? Um, before we go to Revelation, I want to go to 1 John again, 1 John chapter 1, and um, verse 5 says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So you want to be in the light? It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if you find yourself in darkness all the time, then maybe um, you need to seek God and, and let his light come into you. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so right there, we see that there is no darkness in God. So if we are, if we are um, born again, but we feel like we are oppressed by darkness, then that darkness is not from God, and we can resist that. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, but you have to first submit to God. So you have to seek God and say, why is this here, Lord? Help me, I want to seek you. And if you know that there's sin in your life, you know that there are things that you are involved in that are not pleasing to the Lord, then that's something that you can ask God to forgive you for. And once you have submitted to God, repented of any sins, asked him to forgive you, then, then you can stand firm against the darkness, against the devil in your life. You can resist him and you can tell that depression to leave in the name of Jesus. You can tell, you can, um, but you also have to make choices. You can't just say, you know, continue doing the same things that you're doing and then expect God to flood it with light if the things that you're doing are not things that are honoring to him, you see. And so in order to let his light come in, um, the smudges and the dirt and the, the sin have to be wiped out and, and sent away. Okay, so let's continue on. To Revelation chapter 21 so like the very end of the book well not the concordance but you know just a couple pages back 
chapter 21, verse 23. It says, and he, they're talking about um, the new Jerusalem. It says, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And so what we have learned today is, number one, that the Word is God. That's the first thing that we learn. And that He has existed from the beginning He's the one that created everything. He is self-existent forever and always. And in the beginning, he was there when he started the universe. So he was before the universe because he's the one that created it and got everything started. Number two, the word is the creator of all things. And number three, he is the originator of light. We need light to understand and to, dis and to discern the times. So we need to come to him and ask him. Um, Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call light darkness and darkness light. And that's what's going on in our world today. And God says, Woe to those people who have said that the things that God um, says are evil, they say that they are good. And the things that God says are good, the world today says are evil. And so God says, Woe to those, those people. And so we, he is the originator of light. Let's see, verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So God, God is a God of light. He's a God of love. He is the word. He is our creator. He is all of these things. And he wants us to come to him with our stuff, um, just like we read in 1 John. And surrender it to him and let him fill us with his light so that we don't have, we don't walk in darkness anymore. But let's read over this scripture very quickly. We'll put it up, I'll just hold it up piece by piece. And it says right here, in the beginning, read it with, with me. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It says, verse 3, all things were made by him, made through him, and nothing, without him, nothing was made that was made. I memorized this in the King James, and so um, it, it's it, it's a little bit harder. That it's almost exactly the same because then all of a sudden my, my memorized version comes out instead of what I'm reading to you. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness cannot overcome light. Light overcomes darkness. And so um, let us close in prayer, and I hope that you're encouraged um, to continue to seek God. And next week we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the book of John. Read ahead, see what you glean. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to be our Savior, that he is the Word that he is our light, that he is our creator, and he gave us life. We thank you and we praise you for that. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, folks, nice to have you with me and join me in this, um, in this lesson and as we start out on our adventure in the book of John. God bless you. Bye-bye.